All right. So welcome everybody who is here. Uh, my name is Joseph Cohen. I'm a sociology professor at Queens College. I research content creation, entrepreneurship, and I'm a creator of the Annex Sociology podcast, uh, which was it before COVID, a top 20 social science podcast in the United States. And uh, I run the Queen's Podcast Lab with my colleague, uh, Jason. Jason, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Jason Tuga. I am a faculty member in English and creative writing. And my creative writing is expanding to include podcasting, for sure. And I'm teaching podcasting right now. Also, um, Mike Mena is here, and I would call myself a video disciple of his. And... Um, uh, I've been making narrative videos about living with chickens that I'm, I have to say, I'm quite proud of. <laughs> and, They're good. Uh, and I would, Mike, I would be too. I would be too. Mike has taught me a lot. <laughs> Real, seriously, Mike has taught me a lot. Yeah. Let's take a moment to introduce our, our featured guest today, Mike Menem. Mike is from the Graduate Center. Uh, maybe you'd like to introduce yourself, Mike? Uh, sure, yeah. So I'm a PhD candidate from the Graduate Center. I do linguistic anthropology, uh, focusing on process of, processes of racialization in higher education. So those are like the formal type of uh, credentials. Um, but I think the reason I'm here today is because I also run a kind of successful YouTube channel called The Social Life of Language, which is aligned with what I study so I mostly do videos on language and race. I guess that's the, uh, the core of the channel itself. Um, and yeah, I've been, I've been doing a lot of these uh, podcasts on the YouTube channel. I've been doing facilitating workshops on how to do uh, media production in your bedroom as teachers. Uh, so yeah, I think, I think those, those are all the, yeah. the PowerPoints. <laughs> Those are the highlights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It has a, a very scholarly YouTube uh, program that actually has some cachet among his colleagues and is a great example of how scholars can uh, engage in digital content creation and find new ways to uh, you know, capitalize on yeah. these technologies. So uh, it, we do want it to be more of a discussion. The, the goal that I had in here uh, with this session was... Uh, to meet other colleagues who are interested in content creation, uh, talk, just have a discussion about how to integrate these new technologies into the work of being a professor and talk about, you know, potential collaborations. Jason and I have uh, developed and we are developing an infrastructure for digital content creation here at Queens College. We have a, a, a creative space that's going to be in development. We have a, uh, interns who faculty might be partnering with who might, might have the opportunity to partner with to create uh, uh, programming of some sort and we have a bunch of professional development resources and seminars so we just want to get to know you and if you're into content creation like we are then we just like you to join our crew we'd like to get to know you and sort of have you in our orbit and and maybe collaborate in any way we can so that's sort of the the vibe of this message it's less of a a presentation, more of a discussion. So when we talk about digital content creation here, what we're talking about is creating text, images, video, and audio for mass consumption. And uh, we do it through mass media, as we always have. Now, back in the old days, professors enjoyed a privileged access to mass media, right? We were one of the few people who had lecture halls and could uh, talk to audiences of two, 300 people. If you were alive before the internet, it was a big deal to be able to talk to a room of 200 people. That was a big audience back in the day. Uh, we had our own printing presses. You know, our universities paid to publish our books in a way they subsidized them. And other people who controlled mass media, like journalists or, or uh, similar types, they were interested in, in what we had to say. And we just got a privileged position in the public square. Now things are changing. You know, it used to be that you could make a you could make a living off of you know Marxist screeds, but now you're in competition with a million blogs who are doing it for free. 
And, you know, it's harder to sell books. It's harder to do business by the old model because there are new media have created new informational and cultural products that we as scholars are competing with. And even if our information is better, sometimes we just get beat. Uh, the, the uh, you know, COVID, think of all of the times that society ignored scientific, the scientific community's uh, advice on COVID because they were listening to Facebook memes, right? or podcasters were in competition. These new media, the platforms that we're gonna talk about, they are taking over our information and communication diets, but they also, and they put pressure on us as scholars, but they also create new opportunities to have new kinds of interactions, and create new types of informational or cultural products. And so the hope here was to chat about, you know, this changing environment and our ideas for it and how we might use it and how we might create an environment where people can succeed in creating content. And we'll just, so we're gonna start off with the topic of what can I do with content creation? Like how can I do my job with content creation? For me, I have just made podcasting part of my work. Like I am a public, it is public scholarship. It's something that my discipline recognizes. My discipline's given me awards for it. You know, it's I, I receive as much attention as, you know, uh, I'd say just about any uh, secondary outlet, like uh, any outlet that does a secondary processing of research. I, I'm not a, a research outlet, but there are many sort of secondary places. So there's a bunch of different ones that I just wanted to share some with you just for some ideas and maybe we could talk about it. So the first type of use for digital content creation is something like Mike does which I would consider public scholarship. Now, public scholarship can be like pop science where you're talking to, um, uh, you know, just regular non-scientists about your topic. Or I, I think, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I saw your YouTube is similar to mine where you're sort of targeting practitioners or new entrants of a field because you're dealing with stuff with a level of theoretical sophistication that might be higher than, you know, how does language work? Do you want to say something on public scholarship, like how you see it and what it's done for you? Sure, sure. So I think there's a couple different ways to approach something like YouTube or bringing your work into the visual realm. I think you can you can either imagine yourself talking to other practitioners, other science, scientists, or other specialists in your field. Um, that is definitely one thing that I do. I talk to other people in my field. That's, that's how my YouTube channel has grown thus far. But also, I just made a very conscious decision that I am going to make my content no matter how deep the material is that I'm covering, I want to make that accessible to my mom or my friends mm -hmm. from back home or, and this is probably the most important, my ex high school students, mm -hmm. if they were still in high school. So I'm thinking about teenagers. If I cannot entertain teenagers, then I'm probably not entertaining because mm -hmm. Once you start, once you do this for a while, you start realizing like, oh, you know what? Adults, uh, specialists that maybe are not in your field, uh, they kind of like to talk at a similar level as people do on in every day. Like they, they don't want to be at that level all the time. So I, I, I generally say that um, if you want to re-represent your work, your scholarship or whatever, um, you bring it to this non-specialist plane so that the non-specialists from, from that are not part of your field and also specialists that are not part of your field, all of them should be able to understand. It. Mm -hmm. So if I was thinking, I'm going to create this for a group of, uh, I'm going to create this social theory video for a group of medical doctors, right? There's, let's assume they're smart. Uh, let's assume they've had a lot of education, right? Um, they don't, they know just as much about linguistics and linguistic anthropology as my former high school student. So if I can put position my work right in between those two audiences, 
then it usually results in a pretty good video because everybody understands it. Um, but also I don't dumb anything down because if I'm presenting my work to a group of medical doctors, right? You don't wanna be condescending to medical doctors. Um, so I don't ever see myself as simplifying or dumbing things down. And I wouldn't even put my videos in the category of pop videos either, although they have popular appeal. Um, so that, that, that is my general approach. So yeah. the audience is who the audience is. If, I'm thinking my mom and high school students. And if I can educate them, then medical doctors will have a good time also. And if medical doctors understand it and aren't bored, mm. then people in my field will understand it too and won't be bored. So that, th there's, a, there's a level of accessibility that I don't want to confuse with the idea of popular mm -hmm. because that, that I feel is something different. Mm -hmm. Well, and what you're talking about is also something that any writer has to think about, right? I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's the same set of questions. Like, how can I write this so a broad audience will understand it uh, without losing its specificity and nuance, mm -hmm. you know, and, and intelligence, I guess. So the idea here is a, a lot of people asked about, you know, how would I get started doing this and how do you keep it going, which I think is maybe the single most difficult aspect mm -hmm. of the whole thing. And, and Mike has managed to do that really well. So what we're gonna do is watch just a cu couple minutes from a very early video. I think it might even be the first video, but you can correct me if I'm <laughs> yeah. wrong. Ooh, that's gonna be slow. <laughs> it's gonna be real slow. And then we're gonna do a, very, a couple minutes of a very recent one. Yeah. Um, okay, so here we go. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm Mike Mena, currently a doctoral student of linguistic anthropology, bringing to you a chapter by chapter explanation of Foucault's history of sexuality. Uh, I'm using the very common edition, so the page numbers uh, refer to this one. Um, so this YouTube series is geared toward advanced undergrad and grad level students. I'll do my best to stay within a reasonable uh, academic register uh, as far as vocabulary. Now I'm gonna try to translate what Foucault is saying in easier terms, and I'll highlight frequently quoted sections so that maybe you can go to class and sound super smart as if you all <laughs> have done this. Uh, now I make no claims to holding any final authoritative knowledge over Foucault, but I've been a reader of his for a while and I've read most of his stuff, uh, which I refer to sometimes, but I really try to stick to this book only. Now, today's video will have a short conversation on the title of the book. Uh, we're going to repeat the word discourse over and over and over, that way we can feel like we own it by the end of the video. And we will look at the introductory chapter, We the Other Victorians. Okay, I think I will stop there for the sake of time and we'll, we'll jump into the future. I, I think this is like four years later. Yeah, four years later. Um, and this is maybe the second to most recent of Mike's videos. Welcome back, party people. Mike here with the Social Life of Language, making complex theory simple, but never simplified. If that sounds cool, hit that subscribe button now. Today, we'll be talking about a brand new article that I wrote with Ophelia Garcia entitled Converse Racialization and Unmarking Language, the Making of a Bilingual University in a Neoliberal World. I made another video on this article, but focusing on the keywords converse racialization and unmarking. But there is a third and just as important concept in this article, something that we call 
the language elsewhere. Throughout this research on English-Spanish bilingualism, the idea of a standard Spanish kept coming up. So eventually, I just started asking people, where does the best Spanish come from? And I got all kinds of answers. Oh, Spain has the most pure Spanish, or Puerto Rico has really good Spanish, or my friend from deep Mexico speaks the best, most proper Spanish. So eventually, I began to wonder, why don't good Spanish speakers ever live in the United States? Mm. In all these conversations, people pointed elsewhere. They would literally identify every single Spanish-speaking country in the world, except for the United States. The best Spanish speakers came from far away. The further away, the better. Not one person ever said, oh, my mom speaks the best Spanish, or my dad, or my grandpa. So why is that? Let's find out. Okay. Uh, this is a 17-minute video, which you can watch to find out. Let me, <laughs> I, I, I just want to show you just quickly. Also, on Mike's channel, he's got two really good overviews of creating video content like from from concept to lighting and sound and uh they're ex they're extremely good so i'm just giving a pitch for those as well um i don't know if mike do you want to say a little bit about <clears throat> the evolution of your project you know everybody has to start somewhere and it i just had like a little I wasn't just a little bit inspired. I was I was sitting in a PhD classrooms, you know, uh, as one does uh, when they enter graduate school, and I couldn't understand anything. I felt so behind. I went to YouTube because I thought, well, I need some help, right? Um, basically, what I found were were uh, webcams from Harvard where there's like a camera way, mm. way, way in the back of the room. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can't ever hear the questions. You can't ever see the PowerPoint. Um, I, I really just thought this, this is worse than my class, my actual real class. Um, it was either that or super well-produced two minute videos on Foucault that had like cartoons and like, you mm. know, all of this, but they were only two minutes long, right? And how do you learn a, a piece of jargon like discourse, for example? in two minutes. You can, you, you can try, but um, I, I think I must have watched all of the videos that were on Discourse. And it literally just, um, I just decided one day, you know what, I think I can do better than that. And so I did, I tried it. I wrote out a, a little lecture on my laptop. I put my laptop on my desk and I pressed record. And to this day, that video is still probably the highest ranking video that I have on my, oh. I don't know. I don't know if it's because the other videos on Foucault just really aren't very good or, or maybe, or maybe I was just, just on, onto something even back then. I, I didn't realize that I said, I'm going to try to change it into easier words. I didn't know. I didn't know if I was conscious of that hmm. in the moment, but I guess I was, um, and that's probably the number one principle that still is with me is I, I'm going to try to not, you know, use the jargon so much, super heavy, heavy jargon. The, obviously the production value has changed, right? That was on a laptop with free editing software. And, and now I use very elaborate equipment, but I'm a hundred percent positive. If somebody were to give me a laptop and say, you can only use this laptop just with this webcam my teaching would still probably get across maybe it wouldn't be like in, as impressive visually right but i think that the the pedagogical as aspect is way more important and like the way you step into the idea of content creation your attitude um that is more important than the gear that you have if you step into content creation like me believing that I could explain something that's super, super theoretical and laced with jargon that's dependent on other jargon to define, I believed that I could explain these words without referring to these words. And that is something that I still 
hold on to. And I still know for a fact, doesn't matter how difficult or theoretical anything is, it can be easier and you can explain it to your mom, you know, or your, your friends from high school. You, you, know? you know what, you know what I like about your YouTube page and, or your YouTube uh, series and, and, and these types of projects more generally. I see an organization like the city university of New York where like the government gives us money to create informational and cultural resources for the public. And rather than tuck away your work in a $90 commercially bound book that might be read by 15 people, you know, we're, we're taking the privilege of our position and we're creating informational products that, you know, are given to the public and it's scholarly. It teaches people about, you know, it's, it's not commercial, it's edifying. It's certainly scholarly. And I see us as fulfilling our mandate when we do things like this to educate the public. Um, Oh yeah, and and also the Foucault book is a. I mean, it's not a popular book, but it's it's as popular as theory can get, right? Yeah. Um, I I don't even really cover popular books anymore. I cover peer reviewed articles. Yeah. Like that. That's like talking about a ninety dollar you know book, but how how about a journal subscription to you know language and society you know you almost you almost have to be affiliated with the university to afford all these different journals right um so yeah it's it's even it's even more obscure than popular work or popular books which i think says something too that people could be interested in peer-reviewed articles if Mm. it was presented in a certain way and, yeah. and I don't make any claims of like, I present everything in the article in this video. That's, that's really not totally the goal. It's more of like, let me set up the attitude of the viewer to make them want to read the article, the original article, whether, whether it's in a chapter in an academic book or a peer reviewed article, you know, it, that, that's what I see myself as doing as like the stepping stone into the original text, if you want to get there. Does I mean, any- Oh, sorry, Gochi. I would just say, watching the latest video, uh, that question you're asking about why doesn't anybody point to Spanish in the U.S. as the best Spanish, uh, that would so speak to students who I hear in my classrooms all the time saying things like, "My my Spanish isn't good enough," it good enough, or "My English isn't right." I hear that all the time, you know, and I, I think it's hugely empowering. So it's like translate, it's taking something from a kind of rarefied sphere and making it available to somebody for whom it could really change how they think about themselves in relation to culture and their life, you know? Yeah. And that, that is that, that was also one of the original goals when I was first doing the Foucault videos is I do not relate to any of these people in Harvard, which was, which most of the time it was an older white male. Um, I, I still remember for some reason, always coming across white men that had German accents. Um, so that's, that's what's like stuck in my head when I, when I think of these Ivy League type uh, webcam videos, right? I don't relate to that. Now, uh, not to reify, you know, phenotypical l- racial looks, or racial signs, but I wanted somebody to at least sort of look like me, or at least make me believe I had some kind of similar experience to them. I'm not going to connect with, you know, an 80, 80 year old guy teaching Marxism, you know, uh, in Harvard. I, that's just not, I, I will never view one of those videos again, if I don't have to. And because, because there's people that there are scholars that exist that share a life experience with me. Now, I happen to know that the language thing about like, oh, my Spanish isn't good, my English isn't good. I know that from direct experience growing up as a Mexican American, right? So I'm going to use that whenever I can. Anytime that I can call on an experience that I think maybe somebody could connect to, I will do that very consciously in the video, even if it's just a very small little tidbit little tiny story or whatever because those things matter i want people to know 
research is not objective in any sense. It's always positioned politically, um, in a lot of sense, all racially, um, having things having to do with class, things like that. So I wanted to say like, hey, you know what? I'm not even gonna try to look like an objective researcher because I don't, for one thing, I just, I, I actually don't, right? Um, but also I don't think it's, it's not my, um, it's not my political approach to academia in the first place. The, the idea of an objective researcher, I think it's impossible and it's a myth. Um, so I'm gonna actually play that up in my videos because I can, because it's my stuff and I can represent my work in particular the way that I want to represent it. Um, now with that said, I'm also very careful about how I represent other people's work. If you start covering, for example, work from Black feminism, I have to know that I am re-representing a piece of Black feminist work. And there's already problems with people re-representing Black women in general. So you have to be mm. conscious of that history too, right? Um, so it's, it's, it, it's a complicated process. The whole thing is very complicated from beginning to end. But at some point, you have to just press record. Press record and make something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you don't like it, then don't publish it. You know, but but you'll have it there, and maybe you'll share it with a select group of friends. You know, at some point, my audience was fifty subscribers, and you know what? Twenty five of those were probably my family. So like, I don't even know if that counts. You know, and my mom was the one like always commenting, which was kind of embarrassing. I'm like, I'm not gonna <laughs> lie, but you know, um, that stuff matters, and you have to just start somewhere. You know, buy a microphone, press record, make a podcast. Um, Take out your phone. Use a yeah. use the video camera on there. Just press record. Try it. Uh, Ryan, do you have a? Yeah, I just have a question. I mean, I find all this really interesting. And so, how did you grow your your base a little, right? Because what's the relationship here between the content and like the production value and how you kind of present it? Because it's funny that your first video which is probably your lowest production value, right? Because you just started out is your highest, you know, video scene. Partly that's the content there, right? I mean, um, Foucault is kind of just, you know, popular kind of figure in academia, right? I think he's great too, actually. But um, is it more the content? Is the content always the king here? Does the production value kind of synergize or, or maybe outshine that at some point? And then, and then one other thing, how do you, some of these subjects like the article, you know, like the, um, the idea of not speaking the best Spanish is such a great kind of popular topic, but how do you get people to even watch that if it's embedded in a journal article or something like that? And I love that idea too of, you know, just kind of talking about journal articles, but I'm also an academic and that might not be appealing to everybody, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a lot um, out there. Sorry, I just had a lot of questions watching. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, and if you guys can help me remember, so there was production value. Um, and then the second one. The production value to related to content, I guess, is one kind of thing, right? Like which one is yeah, let's, let's see that one important first. here? Yeah, let's start with that. You yeah, don't have to answer all my questions, don't worry. Oh, they, I, they were, they were <laughs> really good questions. Um, so production value, it's important, but content is king. But at the same time, we're dealing with a certain age group that approaches media differently. If they are used to watching super well-produced YouTube videos all the time, which they are, um, you kind of have to meet the needs of the era, I suppose. Like that first Foucault video was four or five years ago, probably. Four or five years ago, the media production value landscape looked very different than 2021. Right. Uh, so to me, I kind of I kind of make sure that I feel the needs of the of the era and the platform. If you're on TikTok, you do not need production value. That's not what is what it, it, TikTok is really like, how personal can you get? And if you don't if you're not holding the cell phone yourself or if you're not putting down the cell phone somewhere in the corner and you're in your bedroom and making a funny video, um, then it probably won't do any in anything. If I were to upload my really high quality videos onto TikTok, they're not gonna go anywhere, you know, because that's not what people expect from the platform. So there's a lot of considerations there. Uh, a podcast, for example, when it, 
I personally really like podcasts that have that use really good microphones. Um, mm -hmm. I will listen to certain podcasts that do not have really good microphones because the content um, is more important to me. But when when I when I listen to podcasts that do not have good microphones, it I feel it because it's for one thing, audio is very personal at a in a bodily level, you're sending people's voices into your ears, especially if you're if you're wearing earphones, right? It's there, it's vibrating your your ears inside of you. Um, same thing with a YouTube video; uh, it's very personal because a lot of times you're watching maybe your professor in your bedroom on your couch. You know, you're inviting people in. Um, so, all of that to say, quality is one factor in content creation, but the idea of quality itself is an ideological production. It is connected to the platform, it's connected to the era, it's connected to the people that you're speaking to. If your audience is 21 year old, you know, uh, first year undergrads, they expect a certain degree of, audio, uh, of quality. Um, maybe they will have less patience for somebody, maybe they'll have less patience for my Foucault videos, in other words, right? Um, but even then, what makes the Foucault videos feel slow and old, more so than the quality of the camera, is how I edited the videos. Mm -hmm. Because back then, I was using those like blur transitions to get from one scene to the next. Today, Knowing that YouTube is super rapid, I cut out every single breath. There is not one moment of silence unless I write it in the script and I will put wait, you know, or breathe in or joke, which means gives myself, give myself time for a joke to actually hit the person, right? So the quality of the editing is another dynamic as well. So even if you had lower quality equipment, if you know how to edit really well, that is more important than the, than the equipment itself. That's why, I, as, that's why I was kind of saying like, I could probably make something pretty good on my laptop because the editing I know is from 2021, the, the editing techniques, the way students consume media today. So that is just as important as the actual camera that you're using and the editing style that that is, pro is part of quality and feeds directly into how content is presented. Um, so I hope that kind of answered that first one. I don't remember the, the second one already. I don't know if you guys remember it. I mean, well, you definitely, know yeah. That was like the only other part I had was like, how do you get attracted? How do you get people to watch yes. a article type, you know, YouTube video, even though I think that content is popular in a sense. Yeah, that's yeah. really a question. Yeah, so that has to do with for one thing, knowing how to market, unfortunately, um, I know that there is such thing as academic Twitter, right? So I'm on Twitter, I'm on academic Twitter, pushing my content there. I also know that academic Twitter is popular amongst professors and faculty members. They push my videos for me in their classrooms. Now, if I want a more direct audience, the more direct, well, whatever, I go to Facebook. I post it there in a certain way too. Like I don't use the same language as I do over here on Twitter. Academic Twitter has its own kind of marketing. My mm -hmm. Facebook book, Facebook marketing looks very different as well. Um, but I know, and and it's because you know the YouTube analytic information in the, in the back tells you, oh, People that come from Facebook are between the ages of 20 and 30 or mm. 20 and 35, you know, versus Twitter, where it's like 40 and up, right? So knowing where your audience is and then targeting them directly, knowing how to speak to them, knowing, knowing how to write on Twitter, which is itself like an art, knowing how to speak over here on Facebook, which is itself an art. And then there's also just the word of mouth stuff, doing these types of like podcasts or workshops or whatever. Maybe maybe this would be more of, I mean, 
uh, obviously podcast is an old media, but um, nowadays that we're doing our, our workshops and presenting our work digitally, uh, that's how I do it word of mouth style. And I think there was a turning point at, um, a few years back when I showed up at a conference and I think maybe like 10, 15 people came up to me and said, hey, you're Mike. I used your Gene Hill videos in my class. That was the first time I thought, oh, maybe this is my niche, linguistic anthropology, sociolinguistics. I'm going to target that small sub-discipline mm -hmm. and only target them. Because if you target Foucault, right, every discipline uses Foucault a little bit. But if you target something that's very, very, very niche, like medieval history, that would get popular within the medieval history for mid medieval history people first, and then it will start growing very slowly. Um, so the more niche your topic is, the better on YouTube, because you're going to be sending your work directly at an audience that you have to assume kind of pre-exists, which they do. There's always an audience for something, right? Um, so niching down to a very, very, very specialized topic in this age, I think is probably the best thing to do as opposed to trying to be super popular on purpose. Probably, it'll probably take much longer to actually become popular. I, I think super popularity even runs against the main trends of what's going on in media because audiences are fragmenting. And the one thing that I do agree with Mike on is when you are very focused, it is easy to develop a core audience through organic hits because only a certain type of person is going to be looking up Foucault. And there are associations that it's easy to get them on board to promo you. The nice thing about Web 2.0 media, though, is you don't need a large audience. You just need the audience that you're trying to move. Right. So, for example, in my podcast, I don't care about general popularity. I only care about the opinions of other sociology professors. What's happened in sociology has always just been, what do the sociology professors say? And that's a community of 50,000 people. So if I can get 1,000 listeners, that's small by a conventional podcast, but 1,000 listeners in a field of 50,000 practitioners is a sizable percentage of the market that I'm trying to move. I, uh, Holly, uh, I, 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 I want Holly to ask a question. Then I want to uh, uh, just say a bit on different ways you can use media uh, in scholarly work and talk about the media themselves. But Holly, do you have a question for Michael for a comment? Yeah, um, I, I have two two short things, um, you know, just for general discussion. One is like, this is so time consuming. Um, I mean, just I have found it like so yes. difficult to find yes. the amount of time to put together yeah. um, the YouTube videos for my class or they're not even on YouTube, right? They're my videos, but I would like them to be on YouTube at some point, right? But like all this um, sort of idea of marketing and like figuring out how to get your audience and all of that. And then it, it sort of related to that question is, um, you know, what do you know about um, either funding availability to sort of help with that kind of stuff or and or um, marketing yourself to a publisher and what do you think about that, right? Because I, I, I have noticed there is a, um, you may know about it, Joe, but like the Everyday Sociology blog, which is affiliated with a textbook with Norton, right? Yeah, and yeah. Like there's that kind of stuff out there, which is not perfect, but um, it is like, you know, nicely marketed and nicely right. packaged and it's like little clips so you can share that with your students. And Can, can I share something with that. you? Yeah. Can I, can I, because uh, I wanted to talk about this and I wanted to show this, you know, okay, so everyday sociology is great and it enjoys visibility and it enjoys prestige, but you know, the type of prestige it enjoys is from a mindset of the old media era. And I think the new media era, era, nobody knows anybody and everybody's in their own little micro worlds, but you can have enormous impact. Let me show you something. I was going to talk about this. Um, Public scholarship is one thing. Uh, another thing is teaching content. I have a screen clip from my YouTube page, all right? My best video 
is a video that I made explaining validity, maybe six, seven years ago. And it I got... love that video, by the way. Oh, that... Okay, so I know that it's been used. I know the schools because of the analytics. I know that like it was a part of the Manchester Business School's curriculum, these videos. I got 75,000 views on it. It has dwarfed anything I have ever produced in my life several times over. And it's interesting because, you know, I didn't need to market it. Even if you market it, either whether a publisher does it or not, you're probably not going to make money off the video in and of itself. You need to have a whole enterprise. And we teach, we're going to talk about how to plan that next week. But the, the thing is, is your teaching work, you know, when you give it, it's locked up with students and 20 people hear it and then it's gone forever. I have received immense satisfaction from the fact that like I have videos on topics that have been seen thousands or tens of thousands of times, and I consider it part of my life's work. And I think that's part of it. It's like, once you're tenured and you, you know, you're not, nobody's at your throat. To, you don't have to jump through hoops for commercial publishers to not be fired. You can just make this stuff and people will find it if you put it out properly and you can have tons more impact than anything else you do, whether or not you're affiliated with someone uh, or not. So I think it's like, you know, back in the day, audience size mattered and working with publishers mattered because you needed money to put the videos out. You needed money to print. And now you don't need money. And when you don't, because you don't need money, it changes the rules of everything. It doesn't matter if you're popular or not because you have no bills to pay, you know? You can just do do what you do. I'll stop there. Uh, does anybody else want to comment on that? Mike, uh, Jason, anybody uh, with a different view on teaching? Just the idea of, of teaching content or uh, just getting yourself out there, promoing it. How important is it to be big? Yeah. Um, so on funding, there is. It's there. You have to get creative, though. Like, yeah. for example, um, I, I'm starting to look heavily into journalism uh, type funding, right? I'm a linguistic anthropologist. My stuff is on language and race. How can I mold that to get funding from a journalism type grant, right? So yeah, you do have to be clever as one is with all of these grants. You tailor, you tailor something of, of what you're doing to a grant or, or a fellowship or whatever. Um, they, do, they do exist. Um, in terms of actual practical costs of what it costs to make stuff, I think what is most expensive is the time, like you were saying. Yeah. That, that is what is really, really difficult, more so than, than anything else. Um, I used to do videos about once every three weeks. Now I do them about once a month. And I think what's important is to think of this as a long-term project and not a short-term I want to make this massive amount of, of stuff. I want to do one video for every single week in my course. Um, I would much prefer watching a video that the person took time, um, wrote, wrote out a super awesome script, took time to put in some graphics, some sound effects, you know, whatever, as opposed to watching watching a lecture video that looks too much like a live lecture. Like this is, this is very much a different kind of medium. Yes, we're talking, yes, it's talking head, yes, it's lecture-like, but I would hesitate to say that lecturing on video is as effective as lecturing in person. The, the energy is just, it's different. Little tiny pauses when you're, when, when you're on a video seem to take like a very long time to resolve. If you're like talking mm. about something and then you say, um, like, you get that feeling all the time of like, oh my God, when is it gonna start again, right? Um, so you have to kind of tailor the way you teach to teach on video. And that takes time. You know, I've, I've made like 95, 96 videos or whatever. And you can tell there's been a difference between my first, the, the way I used to teach at the very beginning versus uh, nowadays. Um, but also, if you're making media, I would highly suggest doing it on stuff that you love and is already part of your life. Mm -hmm. You know, like um, uh, Jason has a 
YouTube channel on his chickens, right? That's part of his life. And he loves his chickens and it comes out because, you know, it, 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 it's there. Same thing with me. I, I wouldn't pick a piece of academic work that is so far out of my field that I'd have to do all this research just to sound competent uh, representing on video. Right. Right. I'm going to do stuff that I know. That's the stuff that, that I will do content on. Everything else has to be put aside to some other time. You know, though, you don't like the amount of, it is always better to have polish in whatever medium you're in. However, sometimes a concern for polish will prevent people from just putting stuff out. And some, like if you have a home lecture, like even though Mike's first video might not have been his most polished, like the content is still good and it still gets views and it's still out there. So even if you don't feel confident that you could put out something that looks great, I think you could, you'd be very surprised if you just put yourself, your stuff out you'll find some resonance somewhere. I think the the main barrier is worrying about making it big, making it famous, because we don't need that. We already got salaries. We already got, you know, we don't need to pay bills. Yeah, and that's that's freeing in some, in some extent because there's a lot of YouTubers that where the popular stuff lies, that will dictate their video content, mm. you know? Yep. I'm not concerned about that at all. I have a channel on racism. That's like the least popular thing to talk about in, you know, in, in, in public. And I have a whole channel on it, you know, but my, I know that audience is there and I don't have to be popular to anybody else, but my audience, because it's, and it's, and it's running alongside my career, you know? So I wrote an article for a peer reviewed chapter, and then I made a bunch of videos on it, right? The old school way to do it is you write something, you go and you talk to as many conferences as possible. You Sometimes there's five people there, or God help you if you're like the Saturday morning panel after the Friday night when everybody just went out, right? Nobody cares. Nobody wants to go see you. <laughs> it doesn't matter how, how, uh, how interesting your stuff is. Like, it's so hard to get people there on Saturday morning. Um, so I was like, okay, I can either talk to the five people at conferences and spend all that money to get all the way around the country or I can make a YouTube video and get 500 views on the first day. You know, my work, my research has gotten a few thousand views already, right? I don't know how long that would have taken to do it in person, going to all the conferences. Oh yeah, a long, long time. You know, it's like in my discipline, it's like seven people in the room each presentation, mm -hmm. unless yeah, yeah. you're already famous coming in. Yeah, and that time is also expensive and actually literally expensive. That's a lot yeah. of plane tickets, a lot of hotel rooms. Yeah. You know, it, in the yeah. academy and okay. time and in, time. Yeah. Yes. In the yes. academy, like a, an audience of 15 is sizable just because it's such a niche interest. Like, uh, so, you know, it, it's not reasonable, I think, maybe to expect 100,000 people to want to see your content on statistical analysis but like you can you can get a chunk of the practitioners who do care about it and that's impact and i don't see that as any different from what we do in print or what we do at conferences we always deal in in, in micro audiences micro targeted stuff super niche stuff mm -hmm. mara has a couple of questions in the chat oh, mara do you want to ask them or so i was asking um you know, because because for this, it's more of a process question than a content question for me. And um, look, it, you know, for me, I didn't become an academic to become an academic. I became an academic so I could write books. And so I could get my information out to the regular to a regular person I worked in. Right. So yeah. like I, I worked in advertising and marketing for 20 years and I saw the crap that was going on. And so what I want to do is what I've always done in all my academic work is to explain to people, not consumers, where they have agency within a consumer mm. culture. I mean, mm. that's that's my North Star in all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me at this point while my books have been successful, I would really like to take it to this platform. But again, I'm like, you know, I, I tried doing the blog and, and so what Holly was saying before, you know, if you write a good blog post, 
it takes a ton of time. I I thought I could do it twice a week. I couldn't even do I couldn't even do it <laughs> twice a week. So um so like I hear what you're saying in terms of doing it once a month and I think that's reasonable. I guess what the question the, so the question I have is like do you create a calendar and say okay for the next 12 months these are sort of the arc of things that I want to cover um or is it that you know, all of a sudden you're reading something and you're like, wow, that's really cool. I should, I should talk about this and create a video. So I'm just kind of want to understand a little bit more about your process. Yeah. So, uh, so my videos are directly related to what I am working on that, that is absolutely key for me. Um, so if I'm doing something on language and capitalism, right, that month, you will see an article from something having to do with language and capitalism. Uh, it, it, it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of work and I try not to mess up other people's work, which means I usually read most or all of their work before I, you know, uh, try to re-represent whatever they did. Um, I generally loosely schedule three or four videos over the next four months or something. Because, you know, as academics, you're dealing with your academic calendar, you know, you have a conference, you have this, you have that, you have this deadline, that deadline, publishing deadline will be here and there. Um, so just like the process of doing that stuff, I stick in the YouTube stuff. The YouTube is part of my work as far as, as, far as I see it. Um, so yeah, my videos didn't used to take so long to do. But the more elaborate that you get with your equipment, with your editing, with all of that stuff, it all starts adding up and you have to start getting better computers and it takes longer to record and you want things to come out more and more and more perfect. And um, So everybody's time schedule is gonna be a little different, but I do, try to, I do try to stick the idea in my head that I'm going to do one for me and one for them. One video that I really, really, really want to do, and then one video that I think is very important to my discipline. And I think going back and forth every other month like that has mm. helped with the longevity of it mm. because I put I prioritize the stuff that gives me joy personally. Um, so yeah, that I mean that that's what I would definitely advise that make some of the content for you stuff that you love, stuff that brings you joy. Can I interject though? What Mike does in particular though, is like a semi-scripted monologue. And that is a very, very time consuming uh, format for a show. And if you want, for example, like we all write and we're used to producing in monologues. And one thing that I learned in podcasting is that if there is something that you care about or that you want to communicate about, sometimes figuring out formats with dialogue can be much easier and more efficient. So in my podcast, what I do is I pick topics that I, that I care about and legitimately want to learn more about. And then I invite an expert on with me. Now I do prior research and I reserve the beginning of the podcast to frame the issue. But then I just bring the audience with me as I learn about the topic that I have to learn. And it is way easier to put out a steady stream of content because you're working stuff out in discussion. And, and you know, not all knowledge work, not all information has to be refined in a, in a one person setting. You can hash out and come to better ideas in dialogue um, or you can go to live events. Like there's other formats that you can use that are less demanding than what Mike is doing, which is the most demanding in my experience, the monologue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, and I would just to add my stuff is 107% scripted, all of it. Sure. Oh yeah. It, and it takes time and yeah. it does. And the first draft does not, is not what's on the video, nor the second, nor the third, nor the fourth, probably fifth, sixth, seventh. And that's the one that people see, you know, it's, a, it, it's, it's a lot of work. It takes, a, it takes a lot of time, which is, which is why you got to kind of, and, and again, every single medium has a different way to put stuff together. A podcast, like 
it's very nice coming on a podcast to talk and not have to prepare so much, you know, as opposed to, oh, the, this next video is going to take like 15 hours to edit. It's a lot of work. I just wasn't even up for it. I couldn't even pull it off. Uh, the one voice stuff. I just don't even bother. <laughs> you know, you. it's also like you have to figure out what type of creator you are and what your wheelhouse is. True. And what you like. Like for me, I love creating because I like meeting people. I am social. And so the time that I create my content feels like a treat. And I And it's been wonderful to meet people and things like that. So... You know, there's lots of ways to do it is the main point but uh, are there any other questions for mike or comments or anything like that i think tracy's asking, asking tracy's asking you know, i question. just stuck one in the in the chat i'm wondering if you guys um have had your students work on any of these kinds of content creation yes uh, at the queen's podcast lab we have a sort of sandbox project that's called qc pod and we encourage students uh so our interns often produce podcasts for them but also i'm the faculty advisor for the night news and so we have some crossover there and they do qc pod on the on the night news um and i'm teaching i teach a writing about popular music course where students make a make a podcast and also, I am teaching a podcasting class now, and, and part of the class is that students can submit their episodes for consideration on QC Pod. And, uh, and, and the students actually, the learning curve is, is pretty swift, mm -hmm. I would say. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's been going really well. Mm. Yeah. Um, I, I have not had any... Um, I'll put it this way. I consult with students sometimes about media. So right. if, if, if there's people that have started stuff because of my work, it's been through workshops, facilitated workshops through faculty members, things like that. Um, but if I need to learn about TikTok, I'm going to ask somebody that's way into TikTok, which a lot of times is our students. So you can get a lot of good advice and critique from your students. If you just yeah. like, Put them yeah. in, a, in a safe position and be like, hey, tell me what you really think, even if it hurts my feelings, you know, and they will yeah. they'll tell you, they'll tell yeah. you what's wrong. They'll tell you exactly where it gets boring. And then yeah. you adjust real fast. If I can just add one more thing, uh, I think of this in, in relation to students, I think of it a lot like what Mara, Mara was describing her work doing. I think our students are so um, in enmeshed in a, a world of media consumerism that I feel like one of my primary responsibilities at this point as a, as a college professor is to help them gain agency in relation to that media stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that means like acquiring literacies around it, you know? And so, and that means making things. And so that's why, that's how I think about it with students. Mike Mena, thank you very much for joining us today. It was really cool to meet you. And like, you got a really cool thing. <laughs> well, let's see how long it can go for. It feels, <laughs> it feels like it's, it's still growing, you know, it's still yeah. growing. So it's I, I haven't even gotten close to the end yet. And uh, Jason, always a pleasure, sir. Thank you. Always a pleasure. I'm so, and, and again, thank you, Mike. I'm really glad that you, uh, I'm really glad that you agreed to do this. I feel honored. Yeah, but absolutely, man. It was a, it's it's fun being here. I look forward to the chicken videos because <laughs> it, it brings me so much joy. It, it's an event. It's an event in my household. I'm I'm, I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> yeah. All fun. right. All right. One in the works. <laughs> Take care, everybody. All right. Take it easy, everybody. Thanks. I'm gonna go watch uh, all the videos on validity chickens and uh, <laughs> and Foucault. Well, I put them all in a row, right? That's like chickens a mix. first. Chickens first. It's you got validity chickens. Foucault. That's like a that's a party yeah. right there. <laughs> it's a good time. <laughs>